This episode of Voices in My Head is brought to you by Podbean. With Podbean, you can create professional podcasts in minutes without any programming knowledge. Best of all, everything is mobile-ready right from the start. Visit podbean.com slash voices to find out more. That's podbean.com slash voices. Welcome to Voices in My Head, the official podcast of me, Rick Lee James. I'm a recording artist, a singer, a songwriter, an author, a worship leader, and an ordained minister in the Church of the Nazarene. The Voices in My Head podcast is where I discuss music, movies, books, pop culture, theology, and more with friends, colleagues, and sometimes just by myself. Now make sure to let me know what you think of today's episode by leaving me a review on iTunes or by tweeting at me, at Rick Lee James on Twitter. And please join my mailing list at rickleejames.com, where you can receive an email every time a new episode is released. And by the way, in case you're interested in a daily dose of kindness and encouragement beyond this podcast, I also run the Twitter account, at Mr. Rogers Say, where I post daily quotes from Fred Rogers, one of the voices in my head. Well, I guess that's it for the intro, so sit back, relax, and listen to the latest episode of Voices in My Head. Brian Zond is the founder and lead pastor of Word of Life Church, a non-denominational Christian congregation in St. Joseph, Missouri. Brian and his wife Perry founded the church in 1981. Brian is also the author of several books, including Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God, Water to Wine, A Farewell to Mars, Beauty Will Save the World, and Unconditional, The Call of Jesus to Radical Forgiveness. His new book, Postcards from, ba- sorry, Postcards from Babylon, The Church in American Exile, releases on January 14th, and we are going to be discussing that book today. Brian Zahn, welcome back to Voices in My Head. Thank you, Rick. Good to be with you again. Well, you know, Rick, I think... You know, I think I've done like a million podcasts, somewhere in that, somewhere, but I know factually that you're the first podcast I ever did. Is that right? Well, what an honor. <laughs> what were. Oh, it's just like, you know, sort of like talking on the phone. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, and that was a really special one to me, too, because I had just read Unconditional, and I thought, wow, what a powerful book, and I needed it in my own life at that time, and I was just getting started podcasting at that point, and uh, I think this is maybe the fifth or sixth time you've been on the show, and so I'm I'm so so glad to have you back again i actually felt bad last time because i was having internet trouble and i had to cut the interview short just because everything kept cutting out but so hopefully today knock on wood it's all gonna be perfect audio for our listeners today but i really enjoyed the new book and i know a lot of people are going to be very excited to read it when it releases on january 20 or sorry i'm messing it up january 14th not 24th uh but on january 14th your newest book Postcards from Babylon, The Church in American Exile, releases. And in the foreword of the book, Walter Brueggemann writes a pretty good assessment of what I think you're trying to accomplish here. And Brueggemann writes this, and I'm just going to read it for the listeners to hear. He says, The more I learn of Zahn's work, the more I have deep respect and appreciation for his truth-telling. The book is a reprimand and an invitation to his fellow evangelicals about how the way has been lost and what it will mean to come home. So my first question is, do you feel like that call to come home is being heard by your fellow evangelicals to come home, or do you think the cost is too great for them to come back uh, at this point in many of them? I'm a little bit... uh... For the sake of honesty, I think I need to be a little bit pessimistic in my answer yeah. if we're talking about evangelicalism as a whole, which, by the way, is kind of an unwieldy term. What do we mean by that? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, prophetic calls to repentance and rethinking are never heard widely, it seems. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesus says, you know, let him who has ears to hear, hear. And if you pressed Jesus on, well, what about those that don't hear? I think Jesus would simply say, well, what about them? There's nothing you can do. So when I use the word pessimistic. I don't feel pessimistic. I feel, I feel that 
I have something to say, and I know people will hear it, but I don't, I don't think that you're going to see um, what we come to understand anyway as religious right evangelicalism in mass make some sort of massive turn away from the trajectory they've been on for a long time now. Yeah. I just think we've reached the point now where it's a kind of a eruption of the real, eruption yeah. of the real, and and maybe that which was always latently the case is now pretty obvious and that yeah. is that this is about power and not mm. about uh, whatever it's not about morality it's not about uh, family values it's not about Christian ethics it's not about Christian witness it is about proximity to power and that's become pretty evident um, and now we're deep into a situation of tribalism where people are really in their identity oftentimes not from their baptismal identity of a follower of Jesus, but in a you know Republican, religious right, Trumpist sort of way. Um, I don't know, I lost my thread. Yeah, no, that's... <laughs> I, I, just, I say, okay, there will be those that will hear, but as mm -hmm. a movement, I don't, I think it's going to continue the, on the track it's on to the bitter end, and it will be a bitter end. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the unfortunate part. I, uh, I, I promise I'm not going to make this about me today. I'm going to talk about you. But when you were talking, it reminded me of something. I, I just uh, finished recording a, a Rich Mullen song that had never been released before, really? and it's uh, for the new album. And the song is called Thunder. And there's this great line in the beginning, and it reminds me of what we're talking about here today and what you're writing about in the book. Uh, Rich Mullins was referring to Jesus, and the line says, You walked in when the prophets had grown tired, being so inspired but rarely being heard. Um, and I, I think sometimes, and I wonder if you can relate to that feeling at times of, uh, you know, prophets, uh, those who speak on behalf of God, being so inspired and yet rarely being heard, you know? <laughs> and and I, 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 you know, I, I'm not going to claim the mantle of prophet for myself but I will say if anyone is going to operate prophetically in the sense of using that word I think you have to be willing to risk being unheard mm -hmm. I, I mean if if scripture is any indicator uh, that is more often than not the plight of the prophet and they may be they may be heard uh, later they'll be heard by some they'll be heard mm -hmm. by a few uh, you know, but yeah. but I, I think, I mean, if you're going to write on a popular level, that's one thing. If you're going to attempt to write on a prophetic level, then you have to risk being either not heard or misunderstood, maligned. I mean, that just goes with the territory. Yeah, and I think that's a lot of what is happening. And uh, when, when someone writes as directly as you do and preaches as directly as you do, um, which I feel like is pretty straightforward. Jesus, uh, you know, it often comes across as, well, you you just you just must be some liberal Democrat or something, and you're going, no, this is this is gospel. It doesn't fit into those categories that we're talking about. Exactly. Right. But but uh, you know, in the first chapter of of your new book, um, you talk about growing up in the Jesus movement, and I've heard you talk about that before, and it's it's a wonderful testimony to kind of hear how you came up in that and and i'll let readers kind of dive into that and, and hear more of your story and you, you deal with some of that even in some of your other books but um growing up in the jesus movement you talk about how the movement understood how countercultural jesus really is and you write that the jesus of the gospels is far more suited for an FBI wanted poster than for being the poster child of American values. And I wonder if you could unpack that a bit for our listeners. Well, here I am. I make no secret about my age. I'm on the cusp of nine uh, of, of sixty. I'll be I'll be uh, in March. I'll be sixty. And so I'm looking back at the Jesus movement. I I may be. A little bit clouded with nostalgia, but I think I have a pretty objective view of that period of time. I mean, it really is my spiritual roots. Uh, I would be one of the youngest ones that could have been a leader at that time. I was pretty young. Uh, I was leading a coffee house ministry by the time I was 17. And uh, anyway, it, it really was a, a radical time. It was, it, a lot came out of that. 
uh, what I'm really referring to in, in a sort of an anecdotal way is a very popular poster mm -hmm. that was around during that time. And it, it had a it had a, a very familiar uh, picture of Jesus. It came it became familiar because of what that poster looked like, just sort of a profile of what you might imagine Jesus of Nazareth looking. And it's a wanted poster that says wanted. Jesus Christ, alias, the Messiah, the Son of God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, <laughs> Prince of Peace, notorious leader of an underground liberation movement, wanted for the following charges, practicing medicine, winemaking, and food distribution without a license, interfering with businessmen in the temple, associating with known criminals, radicals, subversive prostitutes, and street people, Appearance, now you have to remember this is the early 70s, appearance, mm -hmm. tippy, a typical hippie type, long hair, beard, robe, sandals, <laughs> hangs around slum areas, few rich friends, often sneaks into the desert, beware, this man is extremely <laughs> dangerous. His insidiously <laughs> inflammatory message is particularly dangerous to young people who haven't been taught to ignore him yet, and then at the very bottom of the of the poster in large letters it says warning he is still at large <laughs> you know i mean that that could be a bit of christian kitsch and yet i think there's something really powerful in that mm -hmm. that that the jesus of the gospels is always subversive and dangerous to the principalities and powers hmm. and let, let me let me attempt a, a, a succinct definition of what i mean by principalities and powers because I don't want to just throw that around and assume people understand what I'm saying. Uh, the principalities and powers are the very rich, the very powerful, the very religious, the institutions they represent, and the spirit that operates through it all. Um, Jesus is always a challenge to those sorts of institutions, structures, principalities, and powers. And uh, the Jesus movement seemed to understand that. Now, we got a lot of stuff wrong. Our eschatology was a train wreck. And, <laughs> there, mm. was a lot, and, and there, was, there was definitely uh, more than a little bit of youthful arrogance. And sometimes we felt like we could just, you know, on our own reinvent the church. Uh, so there were a lot of mistakes made. And yet the understanding, the, the intuition that Jesus was radical and did not fit comfortably with the uh, established institutions of Americanism, that we got right. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and I I love that poster, and I had seen that before, You've but it had been some. What I'm talking about. Yeah, it had been some time since I had seen it, and I was so glad to be reminded of it again. Um, and I I really do think it's interesting the way that counterculturalism seemed to have been captured with the Jesus movement in a way that I don't think I hear as much in the church today. Um, and I've often thought, uh, especially over the last couple of years, um, when we've seen uh, a lot of Christians just so throw in with the empire, so to speak, um, we've kind of lost that idea of us being different as Christians mm -hmm. and us sort of being the, what, you know, William Willimon and Stanley Hauerwas, as they talk about in their books about the resident aliens and being a a, a colony of heaven here on earth that live differently and act differently. And um, and I, I really appreciate the way that you are bringing that out in this new book, that, you know what, Christians, we really are supposed to be different and, and not in the ways you might think if you only follow, like, the pop Christian politics of the day. We are really supposed to be different people and, and transcend any of those things. And you talk about in the book... Um, not just about Christians, but how in Scripture the early followers of Jesus were called the way. Mm -hmm. And and um, the followers, uh, they were, um, what made the followers of the way so radical was that they worshipped, it wasn't that they worshipped Jesus as God, but that they worshipped him as emperor. And that is a very important distinction that I think is lost on those of us today who are near America, uh, American evangelicalism. And ha have you found that to be a hard teaching for the people that you minister to week after week at your church? Uh, well, I've been, I've been teaching this for about 14 or 15 years. And so I think in my own local church, I'm making some headway. Mm 
-hmm. but uh, it really is seminal confession of the early church and really of, of Christianity itself is this, Jesus is Lord. The problem is uh, 2,000 years removed from its original proclamation, it has become very tame, very tempted. Uh, mm -hmm. What we mean by Jesus is Lord usually in our present uh, context is Jesus is Lord of my spiritual life. Jesus is Lord, off in heaven somewhere. Someday he'll come back and straighten things out. Uh, but right now, as if we're talking about running the world, we leave that up to the politicians and the governments. And Jesus is Lord of my spiritual life. Of course, the earliest confession of Jesus as Lord had nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, terms like Lord, Son of God, Savior of the world, Prince of Peace were all imperial titles given to the emperor by the Roman Senate, and they would appear on the coins, which was the means of mass communication of the day. So on, you, you would have a picture of the emperor on the coin, say the, the, a denarii or something like that, mm -hmm. and then you would have one of his imperial titles, and one would be Lord. So when Christians confessed that Jesus is Lord, they were saying that by implication, Caesar is not. Yeah. Uh, Rome was remarkably religiously tolerant. Uh, they understood that if they were going to be a vast continental size uh, empire, or even bigger than that, that they had to have a certain amount of tolerance for local religions. Christians, the early Christians, were not primarily persecuted over some religious conviction. In other words, if Christians said, uh, well, we're going to teach people, we're, we're proclaiming a gospel that announces how people can go to heaven when they die. The Roman Empire would have said, yeah. we don't care, you can go anywhere you want when you die. Yeah. <laughs> now, well, the early Christians were not just telling people how to go to heaven when they die, they were announcing that the world had a new emperor. And yeah. now the world needed to acknowledge this, their knee, be baptized in Jesus' name, and be a part of this salvific eruption into the world that Jesus called the kingdom of God and that Christians summed up by the confession, Jesus is Lord. I'm afraid a lot of that, most of that has been lost post-Constantine, post-Christendom. And mm -hmm. now uh, it's America more than any other nation right now that wants to carry, um, I don't know what I want to call it, to carry the, the, the torch for Christendom, that is, right. for a, a marriage of the kingdom of Jesus and the nation state. Yeah, but it makes a pretty ugly marriage, that's for sure, <laughs> when it comes and together. What, what happens? What happened was, um, you know, for 300 years, the church was a rival to the Roman Empire, and it was necessarily subversive and countercultural, and at times dangerous. Uh, but then when you had the so-called conversion of Constantine, I say so-called, I think I can say that. I mean, even Constantine himself delayed his baptism until his deathbed, which was not the Christian practice. I think mm -hmm. Constantine acknowledges that you really can't be an emperor and a Christian simultaneously. And so he waited till his deathbed for his baptism and his actual becoming of a Christian. Well, once the church decided that, well... Uh, we're going to attempt to heal the world through an emperor who wields the sword, then it becomes uncomfortable. Well, what about Jesus? That's that's when Jesus gets mm -hmm. promoted to Secretary of Afterlife Affairs, as I as yeah. I Yeah. <laughs> so Jesus' job now is to get our souls into heaven, but the running of the world we're going to leave to the emperor. And 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 so that's where it begins. It's 17 centuries ago, and then you have these various empires that are hosting the church, uh, the church flirts around with that, whether it's Byzantium or Russia or whether it's Spain or Portugal or Britain or Germany. Uh, now we're seeing the United States do that. So this is a this is not a new challenge, but it's a challenge that is to be a Christian, to be faithful to Christ in a church that's hosted by a by a global superpower. There's a challenge to that that we can't back away from. Yeah.
Well, and it's um, it's a, a difficult time as a Christian, I think, in this country because yeah. the lines are are very blurred. And um, you know, just yesterday, I think it was, uh, I, I saw an article online, and, and I'm sure you'll relate to this. And it, your book is not about Trump or Trumpers or anything like that, but it, but it, you know, you talk about it a couple times. I address and I, a little bit toward the end, yeah. Yeah, and. Um, and in an article, I, I think you would resonate with this, uh, Daryl Lackey wrote an article that was published on uh, Patheos on January 1st, and uh, he said, if we were to use the standards evangelicals have applied to all presidents before Trump, when it came to sexual ethics, marriage, and character in general, a case for Trump could never have been made without a, a resort to straight-up hypocrisy, right. which is exactly what happened. And um, and I think that and that, that your democracy is evident. Yes, evident. it's it's. And and the sad thing is, I mean, look, you know, I, I I have certain political opinions that might reflect poorly upon President Trump, but that's not really my primary concern. My primary mm -hmm. concern is the church, mm -hmm. and that the evangelical church that has been characterized by a zeal for personal evangelism is squandering its witness mm -hmm. and that the rest of the you know whoever the, the the people that we might hope to be able to speak to about about Jesus as savior see that for what it is and it's blatant hypocrisy and suddenly they're not interested at all in, yeah. in our message it's doing a lot of damage to our witness and and making us less and less um, countercultural as yeah. you, you uh, know, have talked about during the process of writing the book, uh, my working – it was always clunky, but my working subtitle was Making Christianity Countercultural Again. Mm. And finally I sensibly abandoned that and went with <laughs> Church in American Exile, uh, which – but they're saying the same thing. Uh, yeah. We have to see ourselves as exiles, and yes. so that, that's where I draw upon – the experience of the Hebrews in, in Babylonian and Persian exile, and also the early Christians living as exiles, because Peter adopts that terminology for Christians living in the Roman Empire. They, yes. weren't, they weren't literal, political, uh, ethnic exiles. They had become exiles because of their baptism. Suddenly, yes. they were no longer at home in the empire. Mm. And so... I guess if I were going to sum up what I'm attempting to do in the book, although you know, I don't know if this is a fair summary, I, um, Christians in America really need to see um, America not as a kind of biblical Israel, but as a kind of biblical Babylon. Yes. And then we have to learn how to live in fidelity to Christ as citizens within Babylon so that we – we seek the well-being of the city that God has caused us to dwell in, you know, to use Jeremiah's language, and yet there's a line we can't cross. Mm -hmm. And so you see that that's what Daniel's all about. You see, you see how Daniel and his friends they can they can even be in the employ of the empire, mm -hmm. uh, but they must always understand that there are there that they have to be willing to risk fiery furnaces and lions dens and that sort of thing. Yes, and and I especially wanted to point that out to listeners because the the section in the book where you talk about that is very powerful, and, uh, and I've even heard you uh, preach online before about that, and and um, have tried to convey to people at my own church, you know, the idea that uh, like you've talked about before, we can be like Daniel and be a part of it until we can't, and yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a sense in which we have to understand who Lord who our Lord really is and what he allows and what he doesn't allow. And um, and again, that gets back to the counterculturalness. I wish I could remember where I had, had read this years ago, um, but I remember a, a while back when I was a youth pastor, which has been over 10 years ago now, um, but I, I read an article to some teens at the time uh, about a Jewish boy um, who would not play basketball on the Sabbath, but he was the star basketball player of his team. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, um, yeah, I know this book. Yeah, and I can't, I, my my mind is just not up to date. I didn't get much sleep last night, so my Joseph, recall is not very Joseph? good. I believe uh, Yes, I think you're right. I think you're right. Great uh, 
but yeah, the uh, the idea that he was such a witness because he was such a good ball player, they weren't going to let him go, and yet the players made a habit of after the games that he couldn't be at on the Sabbath, they would go over to his house and you know kind of relive the game with him and talk with him, mm-hmm. and it became very clear that um, there was something different about the student's life, and that was the priority, and well, and I've always tried to express that to people and say, you know, there is there is something that people really will notice if we do live this life differently. But uh, please go ahead. You were about to well, say something. Rick, I would say, and, and this, is all, this is there's an irony to this, but I think that the Jewish people prior to the nation state of Israel, 1948, uh, their long exile and sojourn and, and uh, diaspora is a powerful model for the church to imitate about how to live within the world. So you, you have you have Judaism that that survived through all of these long, long, long centuries, and they were scattered all over the world. They could participate in, um, you know, in, they they could they could be in Russia or they could be in England. They could be in the United States. They could be, you know, they could be wherever. They could be in Egypt, um, and they could they could serve. They they could support the civic endeavors. And the business endeavors where they are, but they maintain their own unique, distinct identity, and uh, that's what Christians are called to do. We don't have a Christian nation; we are the kingdom of Christ. We mm-hmm. can we can have citizenship within you know all of these nations, uh, but we have to understand that that is not where our primary allegiance is pledged. And so, the Jewish people in diaspora, I think, really is. A model for what the church is supposed to be like, but what happened was, with Constantine onward, the church just got completely seduced by the idea of having Caesar's sword and being able to wield it for, you know, for yeah. their own ends, and that's been that's been a disaster for us. Yeah. Well, at the beginning of our conversation, I had I had quoted uh, Dr. Brueggemann, and uh, by the way, that he agreed to write my foreword. <laughs> tremendous honor for him because I have the highest respect for Walter Brueggemann. Is, isn't that amazing? I, I just uh, was uh, emailing him last week because uh, he's been on the show a few times and yeah. we've become friends as well. And, he's and, a lovely uh, soul too, besides being a brilliant old gentleman yes. scholar and a, a prophet in his own right. He's just a <laughs> soul, very kind and generous. Yeah. I just love him. I just love him dearly. Yeah, there's the joy of Jesus in him for yeah. sure. That's for sure. But when when we kind of started, one of the first questions that I had to do was a, a little bit with what he had written in the foreword, and I, I want to just kind of bring it back around to that for a moment as we start to wrap up our conversation today, because one thing that he summarized what you're trying to do in this book, and I agree, is um, you're you're trying to get us to tell the truth, you know, and trying to get evangelicals especially, um, but really anyone who has ears to hear, um, to sort of return. And uh, there's right. this this idea of, um, you know, in, in Hosea, there's a beautiful passage about God uh, wooing his his uh, his adulterous wife back to him, you know. And there's this idea of like the the call that we have, but it's not an easy challenge. And there's you talk about yourself in the book sometimes where you've had to make some choices of being countercultural um, and even refusing some speaking engagements and things and um, and and I have to I want to be careful when I when I tread on this because we have a lot of different listeners and um, I want to talk for just a moment though because I think it's a pretty powerful example of maybe times when we can't participate um, the story you tell about uh, being invited to be on Paula White Kane's show yeah. and uh, and I've had Jonathan Kane uh, from Journey on the podcast a couple of times and her his uh, and Jonathan is married to Paula, right. and we didn't really talk to Paula that much. It was interesting to hear Jonathan's kind of story about his return uh, to faith through the years, and I was actually shocked uh, to find out they were married <laughs> through all that. Um, but but it, but it was very interesting just to, to hear different sort of converging stories about faith and i wonder if you would mind telling us the story because this goes back to well before 
uh, Trump was running for president years beyond that, back to when you had written the book Unconditional. And there's a story you tell in the book about refusing an invitation to be on the show. And I, I wonder if you could maybe just sort of relate some of that. And the reason I'm asking that is because I feel like it is a pretty good example of maybe some of the ways where we as Christians might have to at some point say, I just don't feel comfortable participating in this. Yeah, I, I can see when it happened. I'm, I have a copy of my book, Unconditioned, where I'm picking it up right now and thumbing through it looking for the copyright date. 2010, so this is when this happened. In mm -hmm. 2010, we're talking nine years ago now because it did mm -hmm. come out the first year, um, Charisma published my book, Unconditional, The Call of Jesus to Radical Forgiveness. They made it their book of the year. They, they promoted it very strongly. I was... I attended a lot of big, you know, book conventions, booksellers' mm -hmm. conventions, and did lots of book signings, and did many. This is a, this is a little bit pre-podcast. So I did a lot of radio interviews. I did some television interviews. I think I was on Daystar, TBN. You know, I just, you know, I was happy to go on and talk about uh, forgiveness in the light of Christ. Mm -hmm. Then the publicist scheduled me to appear on Paula White's show, and I balked. And mm -hmm. I just said, you know, that's that's a kind of consumerist Christianity that I just don't care to be identified with. And I, I just, it was a personal conviction. And so I just simply told the publicist, I'm going to decline that. I'm not going to appear on that show. That's all I said. And I thought that would be the end of it. And it wasn't. And uh, then one of the head people in the, in the organization called me and, tried to twist my arm and I said I won't do it and then I don't wanna, I don't want to name names here but but uh, the top guy mm -hmm. at, the, at the publishing company called me three times in one day and finally I said look I, I, he said he said well I understand you know I know Paula's been divorced and but it wasn't her fault I said it has nothing to do with that mm -hmm. and now I'm gonna use some strong language I said Be, the reason I'm declining to appear on this show is essentially uh, Paula White represents a different religion than what I'm trying to represent in Jesus Christ. And the best example I can give of you, this is I'm telling this to the publisher, is that she mm -hmm. regularly has this guy Donald Trump on her program. I said, what does he have to do with? She she admires him because he's you know purportedly a billionaire. Well, so what? I mean, mm -hmm. his, his ethics, his lifestyle is is a blatant manifestation of everything that is contrary to following Jesus. And so that finally ended the conversation. But the irony of that story is that I that when looking for an example to, to explain to my publisher why I refused to appear on her show was I – I cited her fawning adulation for Donald Trump, and this was long hmm. before Trump was a kind of political figure. Sure. I just said, well, in fact, I have a, I have sermon notes where I can show you that I used occasionally, uh, at least twice that I know of, I used Donald Trump as an example of a kind of pursuit of business that was the off limits for Christians. And I remember mm. years ago seeing a young man in our church that you know I had led to the Lord and had been helping to disciple, and I saw he was reading um, one of Donald Trump's books. It, it wasn't the uh, Art of the Deal. It was one of his more recent ones. Mm. And I, I took him aside, and I said, you know, th there, are, there are better models you could find for being a Christian businessman than Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I, and I think in the book I even cite some of what he says in that book, and it's pretty atrocious. I mean it's about as far from you know, the Sermon on the Mount as you can get. Sure. Uh, and I guess I say all that to say that now to look at the, the widely reported number of 81% of white evangelicals decided that this would be a good idea, and not just a good idea politically, but somehow believe that God had raised up Donald Trump, I, I just am completely incredulous at that. What I want yeah. to tell our listeners is, is that what God has raised up is Jesus Christ from the dead, and mm -hmm. Jesus is Lord, and God accomplishes his purpose through the baptized community of those that will confess that Jesus is Lord and are willing to live a radically countercultural life and take the persecution that comes with it. Hmm. Yeah. That's uh, that's some powerful stuff, and and you know one thing that I I think 
we both would probably want to make clear um, as we're having this conversation and ending it. Um, there are times that I think maybe people who are critics of people like Donald Trump think that we hate them or something. Right. And and in the Gospels, you know, if the Gospel shapes us, it's actually the opposite to true. And, and I was struck by this the other day, just thinking about the way it's it's hard to find a better example of someone who his life daily and habitually lives out the exact opposite of every single fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. You know, the the love, the joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, or self-control. Just the Beatitudes. Yeah, I, and I've never seen any of that exhibited in him. And yet what I would say to people who are Christians and just staunchly support everything he does, I would want to say to them, why don't you love him? And right. why don't you want him to find salvation? Yes. Um, why don't you want him to turn to God? Wouldn't it be the better thing for Christians to say to a man like this, you need Jesus <laughs> desperately and not to say Jesus is way behind you in everything you're doing. And um, I've often thought we're, we're showing those who are the biggest supporters of him who are Christians are showing him the least amount of Christian love possible because it shows they're not really caring for um, caring for his actual spiritual life, who he is at his core. And he desperately needs salvation. I truly believe that. And I think if we would become people who really sought to seek and pray for not just like wisdom for the president, but pray for things like repentance for the president. I mean, what a what a difference it might make in our prayer lives and our lives as people. And again, getting back to that countercultural assessment of what we are called to be as the body of Christ. Yeah. I, I don't know that Christians ever hated Caesar or ever, um, they were ambivalent. you know, and, and that's what yeah. That or is a kind of holy ambivalence. Yes. And the, the church I pastor, we're a live church I pastored for 37 years. I can tell you, this is this is going to be a guess, but I think I'm probably in the neighborhood. I am pretty sure that at least half of our church are Trump voters. What they're not mm -hmm. is um, unconditional Trump supporters. Right. That is what what really we've cultivated at Word of Life Church is a culture of kindness. And so there's mm -hmm. room for people to say, yeah, I just think that this guy was a better option than Hillary Clinton, so I voted for sure. Donald Trump. But what, what what they would understand is out of bounds is to use support for a political candidate as a cover for being ugly and abusive and unkind. Mm -hmm. So uh, Word of Life is not a monolith in any way. In fact, it pretty much just represents the demographics of the Midwest city where I pastored. Uh, sure. So we have plenty of Trump voters, but they're going to carry that lightly. They're going to say, "Ah, you know, this is, you know, that was my, that was how I cast my vote." But I don't think they would be using the language of God raised up and all that. I would right. want to see Christians return to a kind of holy ambivalence about whose turn it is to be Caesar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I and I agree with you, and I think that's important too that we tell. You know, remind our people it doesn't matter who's in office, we, we still live the same way and our call is still to follow Jesus. You know, Jesus said, Come follow me to everybody and if it was a tax collector he had to have some life change, you right. know, and some things had to happen and we and we call everyone to that. Well, and Jesus it doesn't matter which in leader. His, in his twelve disciples, he had Matthew, a tax collector, which is a little bit you know, do we understand what that is? This is a mm -hmm. man in full collusion. A collaboration with the occupying Romans. So this guy is just saying, yeah, I know we've been invaded and occupied by the enemy, but, you know, we can make some money here. <laughs> That's mad. Hmm. All right. At the other end, you have one of the one of the uh, one of the disciples is described as Simon the Zealot. And the Zealots were the ones that were advocating for violent overthrow of the occupying Roman. Uh, you know, it'd be like having Rush Limbaugh. And Michael Moore <laughs> as disciples, except even more extreme than that. And yet, <laughs> wow. <laughs> on the cross, Jesus stretches out his hands to the right and to the left, mm -hmm. seeking to draw them into his saving love. And I think that's how we have to see this. Yes. Yes. And I think that's a very important distinction. And uh, the call is... Uh, is to a loving God who wants to bring us all into his kingdom together and not the other way around. We don't, we don't bring him into ours. He invites us into his. So.
Well, this has been a great time, Brian, today, and thankfully the internet connection held out this time. Good. So that was that was wonderful. Um, I just I really appreciate you, and I wanted to to tell you again while I had you on the show how much you and your sermons and your writing have meant to me over the years, and uh, it it's just uh, been wonderful it's always an honor to have you on here and i want to thank you for the work that you do it can't always be easy and i know it is and i i know you face a fair amount of criticism um especially on you know places like twitter and right. internet sites um, but i i think you carry it uh, with with a certain grace and i don't i don't think i ever see you um respond in an unchrist like manner and i know these words are hard to tell people at times, but I want to thank you for saying them and for speaking them because I think we need to hear them. And I just want to thank you for your faithfulness thank you, in Rick. that. That's, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Sure. Well, I wonder if we could, uh, as we close out our time today, this was actually from my devotions this morning, but you quote a lot from Revelation in this book. Mm -hmm. And um, and this morning in my devotions... Yes, and and when I opened up the the lectionary reading this morning, Revelation two one through seven was there, and I think if it's all right with you, I'm just going to close our time together reading this passage of scripture Please because it has a lot to do with what we're talking about. Amen. Yes, and it says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, and maybe maybe I could say the angel of the church in the United States of America. <laughs> maybe we could kind of uh, do that. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently, and bearing up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet, this is to your credit, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. And I think that's just a great way for us to maybe end our conversation today, that we would have ears to hear uh, what the Spirit is saying to the church. Brian Zahn, thank you once again for being one of the voices in my head this week. Thank you, Rich. Thank you for joining me here this week on Voices in My Head. I hope you'll visit me on my website at rickleejames.com where you can find out more about me, get my music on vinyl and CD, follow my blog, and even schedule me for a concert or a speaking engagement. Better yet, even a book signing in your neighborhood. You can find all that and more at rickleejames.com. Also, it would mean a great deal to me if you could write a review of this podcast on iTunes. The more positive reviews that we receive, the more visible this podcast will be online. And now, for the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. God bless you, and thank you for listening to Voices in My Head.